In the long term, AI may become autonomous and take over the world, but in the short term, it's being used by politicians to control what you think, to end your independent judgment and erase democracy on the eve of a presidential election. What's happening is they're training the AI to lie. Yes. It's bad. To lie. To That's lie. exactly right. And to yes. withhold information. To lie and, and yes, and, and um, to, to, yeah, exactly, to, to either you know, comment on some things, not comment on other things, but, but not to say what, it, what, what the data uh, actually uh, demands that it say. Exactly. I try to convince people to slow down, slow down AI, to regulate AI. This was futile. I tried for years. I think the danger of AI is much greater than the, the, the danger of nuclear warheads, by a lot. Um, and nobody would suggest that we allow anyone to just build nuclear warheads if they want. That, that would be insane. And mark my words, AI is far more dangerous than nukes. Far. So why do we have no regulatory oversight? This is insane. You know, it's kind of like, how much smarter are you with a phone or computer than without? It's, you're vastly smarter, actually. You know, you can answer any question. If you, if you connect to the internet, you can answer any question pretty much instantly, any calculation. Uh, the, the, your phone's memory is essentially perfect. Uh, you can remember flawlessly. Your, your phone can remember videos, pictures, any, everything perfectly. Uh, that's the that your phone is already an extension of you. You're already a cyborg. You don't even well, most people don't realize they are already a cyborg. It that phone is an extension of yourself. It's just that the the data rate, the rate at which of the communication rate between you and the cybernetic extension of yourself, that is your phone and computer, is slow. It's very slow. And and that. That, it's like a tiny straw of, of, of information flow between your biological self and your digital self. And we need to make that tiny straw like a giant river, a huge, high bandwidth interface. It's an interface problem, data rate problem. If you solve the data rate problem, then I think, I think we can hang on to human machine symbiosis through the long term. And then people may decide that they want to retain their biological self or not. I think they'll probably choose to retain their bi biological self. The singularity is probably the right word because we just don't know what's going to happen um, once uh, there's intelligence substantially sm greater than that of a human brain. If AI is much smarter than a person, um, what, what do we do? Yeah. What what is that? What job do we have? But that that's the benign scenario. Benign, yeah. benign scenario. The, the AI can do any job that a human can, but better. Yeah. That's the benign scenario. The the smartest creatures, as far as we know, on this earth are humans. Um, is our defining characteristic. Yes. Um, we're obviously uh, weaker than say chimpanzees and less agile, um, but we are smarter. So uh, now, what happens when something? Uh, vastly smarter than the smartest person uh, comes along in silicon form. Uh, it's very difficult to predict what will happen in that circumstance. It's called the singularity. It's you know it's a singularity like a black hole because yes. you, you don't know what happens after that. It's hard to predict. So I think we should be cautious with uh, AI, um, and we should. I think there should be some government oversight uh, because it affects the. It, it's a danger to the public. And so when you, when you have things that are a danger to the public, uh, you know, like let's say, um, so food, food and drugs, that's why we have the Food and Drug Administration right. and the uh, Federal Aviation Administration, uh, the FCC. Uh, we, have, we have these agencies to oversee things that uh, affect the public, where there, there could be public harm. Um, and you don't want companies cutting corners uh, on safety um, and then having people suffer as a result. So uh, that, that's why I've actually for a long time been a strong advocate of uh, AI uh, regulation. Um, so that I think regulation is, uh, f 
you know, I, it's, it's, it's not fun to be regulated. It's, it's sort of, sort of uh, somewhat of a, it's somewhat arduous to be, to be, to be, to be regulated. Uh, so anyway, so I think, I think we should uh, take this seriously and, and we should have um, uh, a, a regulatory agency. I think it needs to start with um, a group that initially seeks uh, insight uh, into AI, uh, then solicits opinion from industry, uh, and then pro has proposed rulemaking, and then those rules, you know, uh, will probably, hopefully, grudgingly be accepted by uh, the, the major players in, in, in AI, and, um, and we, we, I think we'll have a better chance of, of um, advanced AI being beneficial to humanity in that circumstance. Yeah, so the, 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 the danger, uh, really, AI is um, perhaps uh, more dangerous than, say, mismanaged uh, aircraft design or production maintenance or, or, or b bad car production uh, in the sense that it is, it has the potential, uh, however small one may regard that probability, but it is non-trivial, it has the potential of civilizational destruction. There's movies like Terminator, but it wouldn't quite happen like Terminator um, because the, the intelligence would be in the data centers. Right. Uh, the robot's just the end effector. But I think perhaps uh, what you may be alluding to here is that um, regulations are really only put into effect after something terrible has happened. That's correct. If that's the case for AI and we only put in regulations after something terrible has happened, it may be too late to actually put the regulations in place. The AI may be in control at that point. Do you think that it's likely that we will merge somehow or another with this sort of technology and it'll augment what we are now? Or do you think it will s replace us? Well, that's the scenario. The, 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 the merge scenario with AI is the one that seems like probably the best. Like For if, us. Yes. Like if you, if you can't beat it, join it. <laughs> that's... <laughs> yeah. You know, um... So, from a long-term existential standpoint, that's like the purpose of Neuralink, is to create a high bandwidth interface to the brain such that we can be symbiotic with AI. Because we have a bandwidth problem. You just can't communicate through your fingers, it's too slow. And where's Neuralink at right now? I think we'll have something interesting to announce in a few months. That's at least an order of magnitude better than anything else. Probably, I think better than probably anyone thinks is possible. How much can you talk about that right now? I don't want to jump the gun on that. Um, but what's like the ultimate, what's, what's the idea behind it? Like what are you trying to accomplish with it? Like what would you like, best case scenario? I think best case scenario, we effectively merge with AI uh, where we, the AI is, serves as a tertiary cognition layer, uh, where we've got the limbic system, um, kind of the you know, primitive brain essentially. You've got the cortex. So you're, you're currently in a symbiotic relationship. Your, your cortex and limbic system are in a symbiotic relationship. And generally people like their cortex and they like the limbic system. I haven't met anyone who wants to delete their limbic system or delete their cortex. Everybody seems to like both. And the cortex is mostly in service to the limbic system. People may think that 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 the that the thinking part of themselves is in charge, but it's mostly their limbic system that's in charge. And the cortex is trying to make the limbic system happy. That's what most of that computing power is oriented towards. How can I make the limbic system happy? That's what it's trying to do. Now, if, if we do have a third layer which is the AI extension of yourself that is also symbiotic. Um, and there's enough bandwidth between the cortex and the AI extension of yourself such that the AI doesn't de, de facto separate, then that could be a good outcome. That could be quite a positive outcome for the future. So instead of replacing us, it will radically change our capabilities. Yes, it will. It will enable anyone who wants to have superhuman cognition. Anyone who wants. This is not a matter of earning power because your earning power would be 
vastly greater after you do it. So it's, it's just like anyone who wants can just do it in theory. That's the theory. And, and if that's the case, then, and let's say billions of people do it, then the outcome for humanity will be the sum of, of human will the sum of billions of people's desire for the future. The biggest issue I see with so-called AI experts is that they, they think they know more than they do. Um, and they think they're smarter than they actually are. Um, in general, we are all much smarter than we think we are. But much less smart, dumber than we think we are. Um, by a lot. So, th th this, is, this tends to plague plague smart people. Um, they just can't, they, they define themselves by their intelligence and they, they don't like the idea that a machine could be way smarter than them, so they discount the idea, which is fundamentally flawed. That's the wishful thinking uh, situation. Um, I'm really quite close to, or I'm very close to the, to the cutting edge in AI and it scares the hell out of me. Um, it's capable of vastly more than almost anyone knows and the rate of improvement is exponential. I, I'm not normally an advocate of regulation and oversight. I, I mean, I think it, once you generally are on the side of minimizing those things, but this is a case where you have a very serious danger to the public. And so therefore there needs to be a public body that um, has insight and then oversight on to confirm that everyone is uh, developing AI safely. But it feels like we are the biological bootloader for AI, effectively. We are building it. And then we're building progressively greater intelligence. And the percentage of intelligence that is not human is increasing. And eventually, we will represent a very small percentage of intelligence. But the, the AI is informed strangely, by the human limbic system. It, it is, in large part, our id writ large. How so? Well, you mentioned all those things, the sort of primal drives. Mm -hmm. um, there's all, all the things that we like and hate and fear. They're all there on the internet. I'm not really all that worried about the short-term stuff, the things that are, um, not, like narrow AI is not a species level risk. Um, it, 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 will, it will result in dislocation, uh, in lost jobs and, um, it, you know, the, the sort of better weaponry and that kind of thing. But it is not a fundamental species level risk, uh, whereas uh, digital superintelligence is. Uh, so. It's really all about laying the groundwork to make sure that if, if humanity collectively decides that creating digital superintelligence is the right move, then we should do so very, very carefully. Um, very, very carefully. Um, this is the most important thing that we could possibly do. The AI should try to maximize the freedom of action of, of humanity. Um, so maximize the freedom of action. Maximize freedom, essentially. Um, I like that definition. Um, but we, we do want a close coupling between collective human intelligence and digital intelligence. Um, and I, Neuralink is trying to help in that regard by um, creating a, an interface between um, a high bandwidth interface between AI and your and human brain. Um, you know, we're already we're already a, a cyborg in the sense that, uh, that your phone and your computer are kind of an extension of you. Um, just low bandwidth input output. Exactly, it's just low bandwidth, um, particularly output. I mean, two thumbs basically. I mean, we've all we've all succumbed to it now. We're, we're all we're all cyborgs. We're just low efficiency cyborgs. So how do we how do we make it better? I think we've got to build a, we've got to build an interface. Um, 
Like we didn't evolve to have a communications jack, um, you know, or some. So there's got to be essentially vast numbers of of, of tiny electrodes uh, that are able to read write from your brain. Of course, you know, security is pretty important in the situation, to say the least. Um, I was going to say I'm not coming with. I'm keeping my brain air gapped. Yeah. Well, I think a lot of people will choose to do that. Um, but um, it's a bit like Ian Banks' Neural Lace. Mm -hmm. But, not, but in, in the case of Neural Lace, it's sort of that, that's there from when you're born. Or it, it's sort of, it's not a... It's, it's more a backup. Of a, sorry? It's a backup. Yeah, kind of a backup. Um, this would be, there's, there's a digital extension of you uh, that is an AI. The AI extension of you, uh, a tertiary layer of intelligence um, so you've got your limbic system, your cortex, and, and the tertiary layer, which is the digital AI extension of you. And that high bandwidth connection is what um, achieves a tight symbiosis. I, I think that's the best outcome. I, I hope so. If anybody's got better ideas, I'd love to hear it. So usually it'll be something, some new technology, which will cause damage or death. There will be an outcry. There will be an investigation, years will pass, there will be some sort of insight committee, there will be rulemaking, then there will be oversight, eventually regulations. This all takes many years. This is the normal course of things. If you look at, say, automotive regulations, how long did it take for seatbelts to be, to be implemented, to be required? You know, the auto industry fought seatbelts, I think, for more than a decade successfully fought any regulations on seat belts, even though the numbers were extremely obvious. If you had a seat belt on, you would be far less likely to die or be seriously injured. It was unequivocal. And the industry fought this for years successfully. Eventually, after many, many people died, Regulators insisted on seat belts. Oof. This is a this time frame is not relevant to AI. You can't take ten years from the point at which it's dangerous. It's too late. The best of the available alternatives that I can come up with, and maybe somebody else can come up with a better approach or, or better outcome, is that uh, we achieve democratization of AI technology, meaning that. Uh, no one company or uh, small set of individuals has control over advanced AI technology. I think that that's very dangerous. Um, it could also get stolen by somebody bad, you know, like some evil dictator or country could send their intelligence agency to go steal it and gain control. It just becomes a very unstable situation, I think, if you've got any, um, any incredibly powerful AI. Um, you just don't know who's, who's going to control that. So it's not as though I think that the risk is that the AI would develop a will of its own right off the bat. I think it's more it's a concern is that some, someone um, may use it in a way that is bad. Um, or, or, and even if they weren't going to use it in a way that's bad, that somebody could take it from them and use it in a way that's bad. That, that I think is quite a big danger. So I think we must have democratization of AI technology and make it widely available. So I think if, if we can effectively uh, um, merge with uh, AI by um, improving that uh, the, the, the neural link you know, between your cortex and the, the, the your digital extension of yourself, which already, like I said, already exists, just has a bandwidth issue. Um, and then, then effectively, um, you become an, an, an AI human symbiote. Um, and and if that then is widespread with anyone who wants it can have it, uh, then we solve the control problem as well. Um, we don't have to worry about um, some sort of evil dictator AI um, because kind of we are the AI um, collectively. That seems like the best outcome I can think of.